as we were singing that first hymn, Jesus Loves Me. And that second verse is talking about you know, when we stray away from Him, when I remember He loves me, and I flee back to Him. I said, yeah, because we remember He loves us, and the Bible says, whom He loveth, He chasteneth. <laughs> Get to think about, yeah, Jesus loves me. If I stray off, He loves me. He's not going to let me stay out there in sin. He's going to chase me. I better get back to Him and uh, get things squared away. All right. Let us turn this evening to our morning text in Philippians chapter 2. We want to revisit. This, this morning we preach from this text on the uh, humility and the example of humility that Jesus set for us. Let us uh, revisit this and beginning with verse 5 again. said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So as we look at this verse this evening, these verses of scripture, I, I want to take and expand upon another thought that is contained here and that is how that every knee shall bow uh, and, and actually well, that was my original train of thought but as we get into it it is more to do with the name of Jesus here this evening and if we read here I was struck by the Thing that because Jesus became obedient, as we, we talked about this morning, he humbled himself. He became obedient. He was obedient unto death, uh, even the death of the cross. And so we read in verse 9, Wherefore, because that God the Son was willing to come, was willing to take upon himself this task and perform it, was willing to, to die for the sins of his people, God had highly exalted him. And this exaltation, we see, part of this has to do that God gave him a name. And he says that this name is above every name. God had highly exalted him. And we see in the Bible that names are important. Names have meanings. Names have purpose. And this is especially true when God gives the name. When he gives it, it's not just on a whim. There is a purpose to it. There is a meaning to it. And it says here that God hath given him a name which is above every name. And that that name is Jesus. I want us to, to look at that. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these 
these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Notice, Joseph didn't come up with the name. God appeared to him and told him what to name the child. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. She's going to have a son, and you will call him Jesus. And so we read over in verse uh, 24 and 25, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. And so God has given him a name. And that name is Jesus. Notice, if you will, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. We read here the apostles when they were questioned as to why they were preaching and teaching the things that they were doing. He made this comment in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so he said of Jesus there is, uh, verse 10 says, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead, so on. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And so we see here uh, that this name is associated with the work of salvation. Matthew 1.21 says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So, and the word, the name Jesus means Savior, Deliverer. And we'll call him Jesus because that's what he's going to do. He will save his people from their sin. In Acts, the apostle said, There's none other name whereby we must be saved. And so the whole work of salvation is identified here with the name of Jesus Christ. Now, God says, I'm going to give him a name. And this name is going to be above every name. That includes Jehovah. I notice, if you will, in Exodus chapter 6, I want to do a little searching here and, of course, along with that, a little thinking. Exodus chapter 6. God appears unto Moses in the burning bush. And remember your timeline here. When did Moses live? Well, he is after Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, Joseph, who they went down into Egypt. Now God is going to bring them up out of Egypt. Moses has been spared. Moses has fled. He's in the wilderness. He's tending the flocks for his father-in-law Jethro. And God appears to him in a burning bush. And Exodus chapter 6 verse 2, And God spake unto Moses, and said unto him, I am the Lord. Here the term God is the name Elohim. And we will look at this. 
uh, in a moment. But it says, God, this is one of the names of the very common. Whenever you see the word God in the Old Testament, it's usually the word Elohim. And he announced unto him, I am the Lord, or Jehovah. In verse 3 he says, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. And the word there is uh, for God is El, which Elohim is a, a form of that. El is a name that uh, it means God. It's used, translated God in many places. And it is used in connection with other words a lot of times. Such as the name of the town Bethel. Beth-el. Beth meaning house of. El, God. So Beth-el is house of God. Um, and so he says, I was known by the name of God Almighty. Almighty there is Shaddai. So El Shaddai. God Almighty. He said, that's how I was known to Abraham. That's how I made myself known to him, was by my name. I was known to him as El Shaddai, or God Almighty. And that's how I appeared unto Isaac. That's how I appeared unto Jacob. I was known unto them by God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah which he had just introduced himself to Moses says, he says, I was not known to them. He said, but now I'm, I'm making myself known to you as Jehovah. And Jehovah has to do with the idea of the eternal self-existing one. And, and so he goes on to uh, elaborate with when Moses asked him, he said, well, what name will I, I tell them? And uh, he told him, he says, well, I am that I am. Therefore, tell them, I am has sent thee. And, uh, and so, I am and Jehovah uh, is the same uh, name we see here in, in chapter 3, verse 14. Um, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am has sent thee. And so he appears here in chapter 6 to Moses. The reason is God spake unto Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, Jehovah. And so in the past, I wasn't known by that name. But now I am known as to you as Jehovah. Verse 8 says, I will bring you into the land concerning which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. In Psalm 83, 18, Psalm 83. Verse 18. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. That men may know that thou, speaking of God, alone whose name is Jehovah. There's none else. There's no other God who is eternal, who is self-existing. Uh, Everything else is created. And it was created by Him. And His creator name is Elohim. That's how, uh, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And so that becomes the name by which He identifies Himself as the Creator. When he identifies himself as the covenant-keeping God, establishing a covenant with his people, 
he introduces himself as Jehovah. I am the eternal self-existing one. I am that I am. Therefore tell them, I am that sent thee. I am the Lord. And so when we see here the word Lord in the Old Testament, it's the name Jehovah. Jehovah, whose name alone is Jehovah. But in Isaiah chapter 62, Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 2. Well, let's read verse 1. It said, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. See that? So even in the Old Testament, God declared what he was going to do. He declared that the second person of the Godhead, the Son, who is Jehovah, he is God Almighty. He is Elohim. He is the Creator. But the time would come when He would be known by a new name. See, a lot of people get hung up on, on some of these things and they miss some very important, very precious truths. So you have a bunch of people running around here today saying, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. But God has given the Son a name which is above every name. He has declared and manifest Himself through another name. And that is Jesus. And Jesus said, you are my witnesses. Well, we'll, we'll kind of come around to that. When they dishonor or fail to honor the Son, they do not honor the Father who sent Him. They're not honoring Jehovah when they take His name and declare themselves to be Jehovah's Witnesses because they are not honoring the Son, Jesus. And the Father sent well, well, we'll come to that point a little bit later. But we see here, shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And, and we saw, read that in Matthew. The mouth of the Lord declared to Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus. That's the new name. God has revealed himself to his people by, by various names each describing something of his character and his attributes. As we was reading there in, in Exodus, uh, it said, God, El, from which comes Elohim, the Creator. As a matter of fact, it is that Exodus, let me back up here. In verse 2, it said, And God spake unto Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Verse 2 there, the word the God is Elohim. When he says in verse 3, by the name, uh, uh, I was known by the name God Almighty, it's El Shaddai. But verse 2, when it says God spake unto him, he's, it is Elohim. Uh, so we see El and Elohim, the uh, name uh, of God Almighty, Shaddai, which has to do with the majesty and power. I have, I'm almighty. I have all power. And so he was looked to as the one who was able to supply all their need because he's the almighty. And so we see that in the New Testament where he says, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, our God shall supply all your need because he's still El Shaddai. 
He is still the Almighty. And He is able to supply all of our needs. So these names, as God reveals Himself there, He's revealing His character. He's revealing His attributes. Uh, who He is and what He is and what He is able to do uh, for us uh, through His names. And as we see here, Jehovah um, as the eternal, self-existing one, the ever-keeping of covenant. Uh, well, let me go back here in, in Exodus when he had, uh, showed himself to Moses as uh, Jehovah. He said, I appeared unto Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known unto them. And I have also established my covenant with them. And we see in verse 8, And I will bring you unto the land concerning of which I swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Why? He, I, I made a covenant with them. My covenant with them is I'm going to give you this land. I am your God, you're my people, and I'm going to give you this land. He made a covenant with them. Now he's going to fulfill that covenant. And that's why he is introducing himself here as Jehovah. He is the covenant-keeping God. And he said, so I, I swear to them I was going to do this. Now I'm going to do it. And I'm going to use you to lead my people out of Egypt. And I'm going to give them this land which I swear to their fathers. I'm Jehovah. I'm covenant-keeping God. And so... Uh, And as we read in Isaiah 62, 2, he said that he would reveal himself by a new name. And that name is Jesus, which is to be exalted above every other name. And I think the reference there, he's not just talking about Bill and George and Tom and those sorts of names. But he's giving him a name which is above every name. Every title. And that included... Uh, Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah. That's Jesus. We see Jesus reveals God, that is Elohim, Jehovah, not only as the creator, not only as the covenant keeping God, but in the aspect of his covenant keeping. Yeah, it's it. He revealed himself as Jehovah because he was going to fulfill the covenant that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God in the garden made a covenant with Adam that he was going to redeem him. And so when he comes to fulfill that covenant, he makes himself known by the name by which he will fulfill that covenant. The covenant of redemption. Of salvation. And that's by the name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. This is what he promised in the garden. And this is what he came to fulfill. You know, if we think of uh, the power and the, the majesty and the greatness of God that is revealed by His work of creation. And the pinnacle of that work of creation was the creation of man. Made man in His own image, in His own likeness, made He man. And as we think of all the, the wonders of that creation and, and how marvelous and, and wonderful it is and how that displays the majesty and the power and the wisdom of God. How much greater do you suppose is the greatness and the majesty of the redemption of that creation when it fell? When man sinned and brought upon himself the condemnation and, and of death because of sin and the whole creation was brought into bondage because of sin and the corruption of sin 
how great then will be the redemption of that creation. The redemption of man. And so, a name, which is above every name, for he will save his people from their sins. We see that John says that apart from him, that is the word, referring to Jesus Christ, there was no creation. No. He is before all things, by him are all things. John declares that all things were created by him and for him. And without him there was nothing made that was made. So Luke says that apart from him, that is apart from Jesus, there is no salvation. Say Luke because he's the writer of the book of Acts. Uh, he records the apostles saying that. That uh, apart from Jesus Christ, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Notice, too, that in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, we talk about names and the importance of these names. There was an exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees here in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 56. Um, in verse 53... They challenged him. He said, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus said that if any man keep my saying, he'll live forever. I'll have eternal life. Well, he said, Well, Abraham's dead. The prophets are dead. You know, we're. They're saying, we're keeping their sayings, but they're dead. So who are you? Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me. Remember, it is the father who named him. No, it was kind of traditional of the Jews. The Father names the Son. But John, or Joseph, was not the Father. God told him what you'd name. God named him. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. You say, well, wait a minute. You say Abraham rejoiced to see your day, and he saw it. He said, you're not even 50 years old yet, and Abraham's dead. He said, Hast thou seen Abraham? Look at Jesus' reply. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now what we just read back in Exodus, because remember, Moses came after Abraham. Abraham did not know him. God had not revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob by the name Jehovah. God did not reveal himself as Jehovah until Moses. But God's always been the eternal, self-existing God. He just hadn't manifested himself by that name yet. 
Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. Jehovah. Before Abraham was, I, Jehovah, was. And that blew them, blew their mind to the point they were ready to stone him right then for blasphemy. But what a statement. God, or Jesus used the name correctly. God pointed out to Moses that he was known to Abraham by the name El Shaddai, God Almighty, who was not known to the patriarchs by Jehovah. It was not until he revealed himself to Moses that that name, that it was, uh, that it was known. But it speaks of God as the eternal self-existing one. So, of course, Jesus was before Abraham as well as in his day. See, Abraham saw his day and rejoiced. Jesus was God to Abraham. And in the Jews' day to which he spoke and in our day. We read in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus, the same, yesterday, today, forever. Jesus, the same. It is as Savior and Redeemer that God manifests His greatest work and achievement. Notice in 1 John 4, and verse 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He said, in this was manifested the love of God. God manifested His love toward us in that He sent His Son, Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. And remember, if you will, what Paul said, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 13, he's talking about the spiritual gifts and different things in chapter 12, chapter 13, he talks about love and the superiority of love. And he said, now by these three, faith, hope, and charity, which is love, he said, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest is love. And in this was the love of God manifested toward us. Perhaps the greatest attribute of God is certainly greatest in respect to us and I would say in his own estimation his greatest attribute is love. And his love was manifest, made known, made visible, declared through him sending his son whom he named Jesus. And so when we read about there in Philippians how Jesus emptied himself he humbled himself and became obedient unto death 
Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, Paul declares. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus has come into this world to save sinners. That was his reason and purpose for coming into this world. That was the work uh, that he was given to do. That was the work that he took upon himself to perform. And it required that he lay down his life. It required that he that knew no sin would become sin for us and take upon himself all the shame and degradation uh, of sin and the condemnation and the separation from the Father that went with it and become sin for us and suffer and die on the cross for our sin. That's what the, the term propitiation, the place where the sacrifice is made, the place where reconciliation is accomplished, the place of sacrifice. And so we see in the very person of Christ, not, not the cross per se, that was just an instrument of accomplishing this work, but the person of Christ himself, he is the mercy seat. He is the Lamb of God that was offered up. He is the high priest who officiated the sacrifice. He was the mercy seat upon which the blood of the sacrifice was applied. He is the place where God meets with us and he sees the, the blood and he is satisfied and satisfaction is made, reconciliation is made there in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. There is one mediator, one who goes between God and man, and that's the man he had to come in the flesh, Christ Jesus. And so this is his greatest work. His love is manifested and, and, and wrought out and accomplished through the work of redemption, through the work of reconciliation and propitiation. God's plan of salvation, his work of redemption is so perfect, so wonderful, nothing else compares to it. And it is Jesus who is the author and the finisher of it. Philippians 2 8 says, He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. All through the scriptures, we are told that before honor comes humility, that we are to humble ourselves and be obedient, and God then will in due time exalt us and lift us up. But the greatest example of this, and all these are merely examples shadowing that Jesus Christ came. He humbled himself. He became obedient. He died for our sins. And because he has accomplished this work, God has highly exalted him. And given it, he has honored the Son. In John chapter 5, we touched upon this. I want to go through this and, and read this. John chapter 5, verse 21 said, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son. Note God the Father hath committed to the Son the judgment. We're going to have to stand before God and give an account. And God has committed that work, the judgment, to the Son, so that all men would honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Even as. There's no difference, there's no distinction between the honor and the glory of one and the other. From our perspective, we are to honor the Son as we would honor the Father. And the Father has uh, intended it to be that way. He has purposed it to be that way. And this is what He has put before us. Uh, he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which
which hath sent him. And so he has purposed that all honor should be given to the Son. And Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So we read in our text, he says, Wherefore, he had not exalted him. That, verse 10, every living creature, angels, men, and demons, will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Notice verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And, he and, and, and I say living creatures because the context here, you know, mountains aren't going to bow down. Mountains don't have knees. Mountains don't have tongues. Sometimes these things may be attributed to inanimate objects. But we're talking about living creatures here. Living creatures with a mind and understanding, living creatures with a tongue, because he says they will bow the knee. And so when he says of things in heaven, he's not talking about inanimate objects, but living beings, the angels, will bow the knee. Things in the earth, men will bow the knee. Things under the earth, the demons, uh, Satan, who have been confined to those infernal regions, they will bow the knee. That is showing submission at the name of Jesus. They do not bow the knee in so submission to the name of Elohim or El Shaddai or even Jehovah. But the Father had committed all judgment to the Son. And he's given the Son the name of Jesus. And have highly exalted him and that name is above every other name, that all men might honor the Son, and it's at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow in submission. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15. submission 
to Jesus the Son. We read there. Things in heaven, all the heavenly angelic hosts, the things in earth, all mankind, small and great, things under the earth, all the demons and Satan who have been consigned to those infernal regions. And then every tongue, all these aforementioned, shall confess. And the word has the idea of to agree together with God to profess or confess as the truth, to assert or confirm. That is, they will, being subdued, be made to assert and confirm in agreement with God that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Master. They are submitting themselves to Him. Now, some will do it with joy and gladness. Those who are the angelic host will do it joyfully. But the saved, the saints will do it. There, there's a, a distinction there. I believe there's a joy and a gladness there that the angels do not know. Some will do it in shame. I believe some will do it in hate. In other words, in the parable that Jesus taught, he's saying, uh, quoted those as saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. And that is the attitude of a lot of people today. Right now, and their heart is lifted up in pride and rebellion and stubbornness against God. And say, we will not have this man to rule over us. But in that day, they will be subdued. In that day, Paul says there, no, every mouth will be stopped. And the only thing they will be able to say is that they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's the glory of God the Father who put all things under Him. Nevertheless, all will bow the knee and confess agree with God to the truth that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Such a one as this is not to be taken lightly. His name ought not to be taken lightly. God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Reason he says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? A salvation so great that it took the Son of God to accomplish it, it took the life of God to redeem us. All oh, but he was willing. And he came. And he yielded himself up to be crucified, to be tortured, to be slain. And yet they didn't kill him. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay down my life for the sheep. No man takes my life from me. But I lay it down. But I also said, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. He ever lived. God hath highly exalted and has raised him from the dead by the power of the glory of the Father. And he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God, waiting for all enemies be made his footstool. And he's coming again. And I believe that's very soon. Oh, the name of Jesus, the name not to be taken lightly. And how shall we 
escape. There is no escape. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But when we come before God the Father, we humble ourselves, we confess our sin to Him. When we bow the knee and confess Christ and call upon God for mercy, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have such a great salvation. We have a great Savior in Jesus Christ. Let us stand together.